Well, North Korea says that it is ready to halt its nuclear program and missile tests in exchange for food aid from the United States. It may be one less nuclear threat to worry about for now, but here in Washington, all the attention seems to be focused on Iran's alleged quest for the atomic bomb. Now, the Islamic Republic insists that its nuclear, pro nuclear program is essentially peaceful. Earlier today, the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini said that holding nuclear weapons is a sin. Of course, that's not likely to quiet the drums of war. Israel has threatened to launch a preemptive strike against uh, Tehran's nuclear facilities, a position that seems to have wide support here in the U.S. Congress. And it's also an issue that's likely to dominate the agenda next week in Washington when the Israeli prime minister is scheduled to meet with President Obama right after AIPAC, the, pro, pow, the powerful pro-Israel lobby, holds its annual policy conference. And it does seem that public opinion is echoing Washington, too. A recent Pew survey found that a majority of Americans would support a strike against Iran in, if sanctions failed. They also named the Islamic Republic as U.S. enemy number one. However, that is not a view shared by my next guest. 27-year-old Sean Stone is the son of director Oliver Stone, and he made headlines recently over reports that he's converted to Islam. He was in the country earlier this month and joins me now to explain why. Sean, thank you so much uh, for, for being uh, here on the program. Now, you've been getting a lot of criticism for all this, and considering the rhetoric coming out of Washington, some would say you're essentially palling around with the enemy. What's your motivation here? Well, I would ask, in terms of the polls that American people are being asked about uh, attacking Iran preemptively, or as we did with Iraq, I would say if that was as just as easy as attacking Iran, you know, that's one thing. What if that leads to World War III? Are you still so sure that you want to do this? And this is my ultimate, my, my ultimate point is to prevent or stop what I think is we are walking into World War III at the moment, between Syria being destabilized and Iran on its, on its border being threatened by Israel and America. Uh, to me, it's, we're, we're, we're in a very dangerous time, and we don't recognize what the con consequences will be, not only, not only regionally, but to the world, because Russia has stated that they, they do not want to see the overthrow of the Syrian regime or the Iranian regime, because these are countries in its backyard and basically on its border across the Caspian Sea. So we are in a very dangerous geopolitical situation. Having studied this historically, I recognize the great game that is being played out between British imperial factions using America against the Russians. And American people just don't have this background or knowledge to recognize what's at stake here. And, and uh, the thing is, though, we're talking about background and knowledge and what's at stake here, but the rhetoric that's coming out from our own politicians that we as Americans are rec elected into office uh, does not seem to support what you're saying. It seems to support uh, the, the idea that Iran is a giant threat. How do you account for that? Well, I account for it from the fact that we have no diplomacy uh, engaging with these people. We, you know, in America, we don't really understand that, for example, the president, Ahmadinejad, who, they, you know, I'm being alleged as being a defendant of his. I'm not trying to defend him. He's not on trial. But he's not this, this, the, the, the military commander of that country. I mean, he is, uh, he has this, you know, basically answer to the supreme leader, to his parliament. He cannot uh, single-handedly pull a nuke. Um, the fact, to my mind, is this. What's happening is we are now in a state of martial law and war uh, globally. Uh, I was told back in December by a very close friend of mine who, has tie, who, who knows a former presidential candidate. Uh, I won't disclose who that is. This candidate's office told my friend by March of this year he should consider leaving the country. And I didn't understand, I understood why because of the NDAA, but I didn't realize that NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, actually comes into effect tomorrow. Now this act that Obama has called for and signed stipulates that even American citizens can now be uh, targeted by the military, picked up and imprisoned indefinitely without civilian trial, thus throwing out our due process, our habeas corpus clauses. So we are now in the state of martial law as of tomorrow, which, and, uh, and obviously if you're counting now the use of drones on U.S. soil, the fact that our president has assassinated American citizens, uh, everything is now in, in conditions for a, a total war state. I mean, McCain called for the, the, the whole America becoming part of the so-called battlefield. America is now a battlefield. The whole earth is a battlefield. So rather than than trying, I'm worried that what's being done is that rather than trying to address our economic, our continued economic uh, depression mm -hmm. and the reforms necessary domestically, what we're trying to do then is create a martial law state 
using using Iran as the terrorist enemy or threat, and you know even making these these claims that Iran is ready to use terrorism abroad, you know you have instances like the the Iranian in Thailand who blows himself up. This could be a false flag instigation. Well, done by a different country to make Iran look like a terrorist. So you see, everything is now in, in, in motion as a pretext that you can go to martial law here and war abroad. And obviously the war abroad has tremendous consequences, not only because if you attack Iran, Hezbollah and Hamas can unleash on Israel, and which then brings America and potentially Russia into the equation. So this is like, we're in a horrible situation and people are not being educated as to what's really going on. And Sean, if that, if that is indeed the case, then who would profit from that kind of uh, sort of uh, push towards martial law, push towards war? Who would benefit from that? I mean, to my calculation, what you're dealing with is, is an economy, the uh, Wall Street economy that has not really recovered from, you know, from, from their overall uh, Deficits, I mean, not deficit. Um, they're overall debt. I mean, they basically have have their derivatives that are still unaccounted for. They ultimately can't really, you know, get get things going. And Obama's, you know, continuous bailout of Wall Street and, and Europe as well, by the way, is not actually helping the common working people. So if you go towards an austerity program, for example, I mean, you could ultimately lead to lead to fascism in this country and in Western Europe. And do you, do you think we're trending towards our our Amer is America so, trending towards fascism? Do you think that that's the trend right now? Well, in terms of abrogating our constitution, that's already in place. I mean, the fact that no one is having an out, is, is, is creating a stir or an outcry about this, the idea that U.S. citizens can be picked up by the, and, and detained by the military without a civilian trial, you know, where is our constitution? Where, where is our, uh, the outrage at the, this fact? Because we're so scared of terrorists? I can't believe American people are this frightened of terrorism. I mean, if you studied, com if you studied the Cold War, you remember that, you know, communists were also in our backyard, and they were godless, and they were trying to destroy our way of life. So, you know, if you studied history, you know that, you know, war and terror is a part of, of history. You cannot overreact and destroy your Republican values in your, in your Constitution, in your tradition, from fear. Well, right, and yet it seems that fear is pr precisely what's dominating sort of the agenda here. Now, I want to play you uh, a little clip of some of the Republican candidates for the White House, and, and I want you to sort of react uh, and let me know what you think about the fear uh, in this soundbite. Let's, let's play that clip if we have it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a president who isn't going to stop them. He isn't going to stop them from getting a nuclear weapon. If you think a madman is about to have nuclear weapons, and you think that madman is going to use those nuclear weapons, then you have an absolute moral obligation to defend the lives of your people by eliminating the capacity to get nuclear weapons. We must not allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. If they do, the world changes, America will be at risk, and someday nuclear weaponry will be used. If I'm president... Sean, you're talking about sort of educating the American people. One of these guys could be president of the United States. So what's your reaction? Well, my reaction is we already have Obama as president. That's bad enough. Uh, what he's doing is a very dangerous game. He's not making a clear stand, even though his Joint Chief of Staff Dempsey and the military, I think, are very much opposed to the danger that Israel, of, of Israel preemptively striking Iran. Obama has only stood by and said we are, you know, unambiguously supporting Israel, we're work, working hand in hand with them. This is not a clear message or a good message. We do not want to let Israel instigate something that can escalate into, as I said, a world war. I think Obama has to be much clearer in, in trying to, first of all, we're already at a war with Iran. We're at war with Iran. We're trying yeah, to stabilize war. them through sanctions. Mm -hmm. Now, An economic war, exactly. And the point is that you can't, you can't engage people diplomatically if you're already trying to isolate them. And what are you basically creating is more uh, radicalism on their part because you're trying to push them into a corner. And that was the test that they've been running, you know, by, for example, killing their scientists in Tehran. This was an, attack, a, a, an act of terrorism by Mossad and Mujahideen as working hand in hand. Uh, in Tehran. If that had happened in America, for example, we'd have gone to war, I'm sure, right away. And, and Sean, I mean, you just came back from Iran. You know, a lot of the rhetoric here sort of paints the Iranians as these crazy people who might be a threat to America. Their leaders are crazy. I mean, that's what we're hearing from the media. How do Iranians see Americans? What, what is their perception of our leadership, given all this war talk? Well, I would say if the Iranians think that, if, if people think the Iranians hate Americans, why would they let me come into their country and greet me so warmly? 
Um, it, it's just, it, it's, misconce it's a misconception on our part to really believe that the Iranians hate the Americans. They have a, a loathing for imperialism, and this is historical. It goes back to the British and Russians, it goes back to uh, the Shah, who was backed by Israeli and American uh, regimes, and frankly, you know, the Shah, his Savak, for example, his secret police were largely trained by Israelis and Americans, so there's a lot of antipathy to the regimes, uh, the governments, uh, abroad because of that. But when it comes to the American people, I mean, I never once felt any kind of danger or threat from I the Iranian people. Very sophisticated, very much like Americans. My first instinct, and I still believe this, is that Iranians, uh, Israelis, and Americans will become good friends again as they were historically, you know, until the overthrow of the Shah and then the Iraq Iran war, where for, don't forget that Iraq was being sponsored, Saddam Hussein was being sponsored by the Americans against the Iranians. Right. So there was, you know, there was a lot of anger. This is a long, this is a protracted eight-year conflict that killed many Iranians. And so the fact that they're still as calm as they are and sophisticated in this regard goes to show that we can deal with these people. I mean, I had great conversations with many politicians, including one of the top advisors to the Supreme Leader. These people are sophisticated, trained in the West. Many of them trained in America or Western mm -hmm. Europe, speaking English. Now, Sean, you know, I, 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 cultured. I don't want to and interrupt you, but we're almost dialogue. out of That's time. Point. and you know, so I can have a dialogue. You know, we're talking about dialogues here. We're talking about your experience there, and I want to bring in very briefly before we run out of run out of time the role of the media coverage in all this, because you know the, a lot of the the coverage that we're seeing here in the U.S. doesn't really reflect uh, this view that Iran is a sane sort of rational actor. And in fact, your trip uh, got a very specific tinge in the media coverage. I want to play you a quick soundbite uh, from your recent interviews on CNN and Fox. Look, 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 the one thing that he said that's undeniable was he said that the Holocaust never happened. And once you get into that kind of a fringe lunatic assessment, I don't care if he believes in the Holocaust. I don't want when, to see when you go met to war. Him, when, when you met him, did you bring up this denial of the Holocaust that he keeps uh, purporting? I mean, it seems very perverse that you would wish to spend much time with this guy, given your family upbringing. You're dealing with a guy who is uh, an extremist. He's a fanatic. And it would be like if you were in uh, Germany in the 1930s and you were talking to Himmler. And so here you are trying to talk about the threat of war. They're talking about your relationship with Ahmadinejad. What does that say to you about the role of U.S. media? Well, it's the role that the media played in the build to the Iraq war. I mean, my father's done a good job of trying to point this out uh, in his documentaries, for example, on Chavez, on Castro, trying to get the other person's point of view across. Why can't, you know, rather than trying to vilify the guy, why don't you at least hear his point? That's the nature of dialogue, and that's the nature of diplomacy. But if we're trying to be, become an empire and, and act as an empire would in terms of forcing uh, policies down a sovereign nation's throat, uh, then this is exactly the trajectory that we're following. As far as the Holocaust, by the way, I mean, I'm not trying to say that in any way I agree with anyone who denies the Holocaust, but don't forget the Japanese still don't acknowledge their Holocaust to the Chinese and Southeast Asians from World War II, and they've, we've, they've been our great trading partner, you know, since, since we dropped the bomb, since 45. So the question is, you know, it, it's obviously not a question of principles and morals. There's a, an agenda here, you know, and the fact that we're, they're trying to create a war with Iran, it helps that purpose by saying that Ahmadinejad is some mad dictator, which he is simply not. He doesn't even have that power in his country. And in terms of whatever he may or may not have said regarding Israel, I, am try I would love to see more of a dialogue opening up in, uh, regarding Israel and the West Bank in any case, and Jerusalem specifically. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I wanted to thank you so much for your appearance here. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of critical issues. We don't really see an honest discussion of the actual threats the U.S. faces in the media by our politicians. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it just takes folks uh, from non-political uh, lines of work, I guess, to, to call attention to all that. Thank you so very much. That was filmmaker Sean Stone.